Thank you for joining me and welcome to the Bloomingdale Public Library Simple Scan Station tutorial. Today we're going to be going over all the basic tools involved and first I wanted to show you all of the parts of this before we take a look at the screen and go over how we can use all of the options available to us with the Simple Scan Station. First of all we have our large flatbed scanner. This is a typical scanner but it has a couple of features. You'll notice when you open it up that there is an angled line here so if you have any books that you need to scan the binding will go across there and you'll be able to get it all the way to the edge without missing any of the parts in the middle like you typically would. Also when we put things in this scanner we can just toss them face down and not worry about lining it up. The scanner will take care of that automatically. It doesn't need to be all the way in but it doesn't need to be perfectly squared away or set up alongside the edges. Then we have our bullet scanner this is a fast way to scan multiple documents. You can put one or more pages into this. You see it says front side face down. What that means is whatever side has text on it, you would put face down in the scanner. Now, if you have something that is double sided, you will have the option of scanning both the front and the back side as you go. I just put one page in there, but you can have up to about 25 pages in there. There isn't a specific limit, but to avoid jamming, we recommend not having too many pages at once. This goes very quickly, so if you have a lot of documents to do, this is a great alternative. We have our USB plug here. We'll use that later on when we show how to save to USB. That's one of the many options that we have with saving. And we have the barcode scanner. You're not too likely to need that, but if you are scanning to send a fax and you want to pay for it using your Bloomingdale library card, you can use that to scan the library card as a means of payment. So that's why we have it tucked away back there. It doesn't get used that often, but it is available if you need it. Now here's the touch screen. You see it says touch here to start. When I do that, it goes to the welcome screen. You notice there are language and accessibility options at the top, so you can change the language of the instructions. Accessibility helps with things if you need to have larger fonts or have it read to you as you go through. I'm going to just touch here to start, and then we're ready to begin. Okay, let's take a walk through the menu and go over all the different options available to us. See, the first thing that it asks after we have begun is to select the scanner that we want. This is very visual. You can see are you using the flatbed scanner or are you using the bullet scanner. Right now there's a check mark on the flatbed scanner. If I wanted to do the bullet scanner instead, I would press on that and see the check mark appear there. We're going to start out with this one first, so I'll go over that process, but either one works. You notice at all times you have the back and next options on the screen, so that's how you'll walk through the different steps that are available. Be careful when you're typing anything in, if you make a mistake, do not press back because that will take you back to the previous page. You always want to use backspace if you type something in wrong when we get to that point later on. So now I'll press the next button. Now this is a key one. It's asking, how do you want to save your work? So we see the choice, scan to USB, scan to fax, scan to email, scan to Dropbox, Google Drive, smartphone, to the vivid pics, text translation, and scan text to audio. A lot of different things that we can do here. I'm going to do a quick run through all of them, and then we're going to do demonstration for two of them. The scan to USB is what you would use if you wanted to simply save to a USB drive. And that's the most common choice. Well, that and scan to email, I would say, are the two most common choices that are available to us. Uh, if you are doing a large number of scans, then you're going to want to use scan to USB as you go through that. If you are doing a smaller number of things and you just don't have a USB drive handy and you want to do it quickly, scan to email works well. Scan to fax is if you want to send something to a fax number. Uh, this can be a very useful alternative to sending things through our fax office or other alternatives that you might want to use. Uh, it does, as you might notice there, charge a dollar per page. If they're international, it charges a little bit more than that. Um, but that is an option that you have if you need to fax something to, say, a mortgage office or any government institution that requires faxing. So you scan to Dropbox available there, similar to scan to Google Drive. Those are cloud storage locations that if you have an account, you can sign in with and you can use that. Scan to smartphone is similar. You can sync it up with your smartphone and you can send the, the images to that. I find scan to email to be a little simpler to use than scan to smartphone and it works in very similar ways because you can access your email through smartphone. So we don't have that one come up too often, but that is an option that's available for you. VividPix is a tool that allows you to restore older or damaged pictures to higher quality. I've used that fairly extensively myself in working with patrons, and I can say that the results have been mixed. Sometimes you'll put a picture through that and the tools that it works with to restore it will work beautifully and will look a lot better afterwards. Other times, 
the results can come out worse or it can accentuate things in a way that you don't care for. So you don't want to get rid of the original files or lose anything that way, but that can be an alternative to play around with if you have some slightly damaged pictures that you want to work through. The text translation or scan text to audio are tools for uh, translating things to more easily accessible mediums. Uh, those are again somewhat mixed success depending on the quality of the original source that you're working with. We're going to start out with scan to USB, so I'm going to click next there. This is asking you to agree that you're not doing anything illegal, you're not violating copyright or any other laws with this fairly typical agreement that you would see here. We press accept to continue. Now, this is an important part. We're going over the scan settings. First thing it's asking is output format. That's what kind of file are you trying to create. If you are looking to create an image, you're probably going to want, if you want it to be easy to work with for posting via email or on Facebook um, or any other social media, you might want a JPEG or a PNG file. Or if you're uploading this to be part of a website, those work well as well. If you want it to be a very high quality image, you might want to go with TIFF. That would not have any kind of reduction or compression in it. Um, it would be something you could use to work with in Photoshop or other image editing programs if you're interested. Other output formats that are available, PDF, that's a standard for any documents you might want to pass around. Uh, SPDF is another version of that. Microsoft Word is an interesting alternative. If you wanted to be able to edit or make changes to this after scanning it, and it was a document that you had, you might want to choose Microsoft Word. That would create a Microsoft Word file that you could then edit on your own computer or using one of our lab computers. The downside is when it scans that and it generates the Word file, it will often make little mistakes. All of these other ones, it's essentially taking a picture of whatever document you put in there. But when you use something and have it go to Microsoft Word, it is trying to read the text that's there and it doesn't always get it right, especially if there are smudges or color issues with your document as you go through, that can be a problem. So be aware of that. Now I'm going to do a picture this time, so I'm going to say JPEG, and we'll go from there. Underneath there we see scan mode. You see color, grayscale, or black and white. I highly recommend either using color or grayscale. When you do black and white, it tends to try to flatten out any colors or imperfections that it sees in the page, and it will often have black splotches where there's just a little bit of discoloration or it will lose things by trying to make them white. So the black and white option is, is very limiting. I would also recommend if you are going to scan anything to a USB drive or any place else where you have a lot of storage space available, do the highest quality. You can always reduce it later on, but you can't ever make it better after you scan it in the first time. So start out with the highest quality. The only time you would want to go to a lower quality is if you are scanning to email and you're concerned that the number of files would not fit there for the storage. I'm going to say next. Now here it's ready to scan. And so you can see some options available here on the view and edit choices on the side there. When I click scan, because I already have the paper in the document, there it goes. Takes a moment here. And you can see the result. So I've scanned the image that I put in here. If I had more that I wanted to scan, I would simply take out the original page, put in another one, and press scan again. Now I'll stay with just one page this time. We'll do multiple pages with the next, next example. If I didn't like what I had scanned in here, I'd press delete, and that would remove the one that I have scanned. Now, once I'm here, I can make some basic changes if I want to. You see the view and edit options to the lower left. If I wanted to zoom in or out of this, if I wanted to fit it to a page or crop it, split the image in half, rotate it, any of those changes, I have that option. I recommend against doing a lot of image editing with this page, although it's relatively easy to do as touch screens go, it's still not as easy as working with something on a computer. So for most people, I think you'd be happier just taking the original scan and then saving it and working with it on a computer afterwards. However, basic changes like say rotating, you know, maybe you put that in wrong or it read it wrong and you said, oh, no, that's how I want it to be. No, rotate it back that way. There we go. That's how I want. Those can be easy to do. Once you're happy with the page or pages that you've scanned, you would press next. Now it's asking me to insert the USB. So there it goes. It's telling me that I have space available. So that's great. I 
I will say next. And now it asks you to name the file. This is again the sort of thing that you can do if you like. Um, you see it gives a default name based on the date. You see Simple Scan Station 2021 0321 and the time. If I wanted to change this name I could and I could click here backspace and type in whatever I wanted but I'm okay with the name as given here. You might wonder what if you scanned multiple pages? Does it create just one big file? It does not. If I had say scanned in 25 images here what it would do is it would create a file name as we see it here for each file and then it would have a counting number after it. So it would be this whole name dash one and then this whole name dash two and so on through all of the files. I'm going to say next. It's processing and we're done. Now if I want I could scan more pages with this or if I'm done, I could just say I'm done and then it would say you're done. It would remind me to take the plug out and to remove my original document. One last choice that I want to do here is save to other media. If I wanted to do that, it would take what I've scanned here and give me the choice to maybe send it to email or scan it to my phone or use one of the other options that are available. At this time, I'm just going to say I'm done and it's going to ask me to remove the USB drive, which I do. And it gives you the job complete message and we are back to the start. Now let's take a look at using the bullet scanner. I'm going to put a second page into the scanner here. So I've now piled two pages up here so we can watch how that goes. I'm going to touch here to start. This time I'm going to select the bullet scanner and say next. And this time I will scan to email. And next. Now it's again asking me to accept the copyright agreement. You will see when you choose scan to email that it doesn't have photo quality. It has high quality as the highest limit available there. And this time I'm going to go with the document, so I'm going to leave that as PDF. And I'm going to change it from black and white to grayscale and then high quality. And say next. Now you see scan front side or scan both sides. If I do scan both sides, it's going to come up blank for two of the sides here. But I'm going to do that just to show you how that works and how we can eliminate pages that we don't need. So I scan both sides. So you see it went through very quickly there. And it now has, as you can see, four out of four pages, but only two of them have anything on them because the back sides were blank for two of these. So I can go through here in the upper right and I can look through all of the different pages that are available. So you see the first page has some text there. The next one is blank. Next one has some content. And the next one is blank. If I select the blank ones and choose to delete them, there's one gone, now it is three of three pages. I'll select the next blank one, delete that, and now we are down to two of two pages. So now I'm happy with what I have there. I could do the same editing options that we saw before with the flatbed scanner. I'm going to go ahead and click next. Now it's processing the pages, and now it's asking me for my email. So at this point I would type in my email address, if I make a mistake and type in an extra letter or mistype something, I make sure to press backspace. You see the at symbol is available here. Then I would type in the rest of the email address. You can carbon copy if you want to send this to more than one person. If you are scanning something to send it to somebody professionally or for financial records or anything that's important, I recommend carbon copying yourself when you send this along just in case they don't receive it or they think it's junk mail and don't recognize what it is. That way you have a record and you don't have to go through the trouble of scanning again. So I think that is a good way to be safe and to save yourself time. Now in the subject you can change this if you want. If you're sending it to yourself, so you see I'm going to backspace here and delete all of that. I can call this example. If you're sending it to yourself, you don't need to worry about changing the subject or typing in a message, but if you're sending it to somebody else, you might want to explain what's going on here. And then you could say, documents attached. And you see I made a little typing mistake there, so I will go back and fix that. Now once you're done with that and you're ready to go, you again press next. And you see it has sent the email and you're done. And so I'll say I'm done. 
job is complete. Thank you. So those are the key things that you're going to want to learn how to do working with Symbol Scan Station. If there's any interest, I'd be happy to show people more details that are available here, how to use some of the accessibility tools or how to use some of the uh, higher level image editing. But I wanted a quick video just to get you started with this and show you around. Uh, this is a very popular tool at the library. It gets used a few thousand times every month, and I highly recommend it. If anybody has anything that they need to scan or archive, very helpful and easy to use once you get started with it. So thank you very much, and have a great day.